Hello, and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church's Sermon Podcast for Sunday, December 10th, 2017, the second week of Advent. It's the 13th week of the story, our 31-week journey through the Bible. Today, Rev. Dr. Paul Cunningham is looking at chapter 13 of the story, King Solomon. Paul's sermon is titled, Living Wisely, and he's looking at two sections from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, and chapter 4, verses 29 through 34. Please listen after the sermon for a few announcements. You can also learn about what's happening at La Jolla Prez by visiting our website, ljpress.org, downloading the La Jolla Press app on your smartphone or tablet, or by contacting the church office at 858-454-0713. And now, here's Paul with Living Wisely. So just to uh, kind of let people, some folks are asking, you know, what is uh, Christmas Eve going to look like? Because as you may realize or not realize at this point, um, Christmas Eve actually happens on a Sunday. And so um, we will be doing one um, worship service on Sunday morning at 930 in the morning here in the sanctuary and bringing all services together. Um, at 930, we'll be looking at the Gospel of Mark, the first three verses, and then Christmas Eve evening, I guess, Christmas Eve at 5, 7, and 9. Um, there'll be a different service, um, different message. Some people are like, are you preaching the same thing Sunday morning and Sunday night? The answer to that is no. So you can come to church twice and hear two different messages. Hopefully they'll all come together for by that time. So, um, but we'll have 5 o'clock is our family service, which is, um, you know, all of our young families coming in. And then 7 and 9 o'clock is our traditional candlelight service. So um, that's kind of the plan for Christmas Eve. Now, as I mentioned last week, if you were here, and if not, um, hopefully this will be an encouragement to you. You know we are working our way uh, through the story and um, trying to get through all 31 chapters of that by week, the time we get to the end of April. And on December 24th and December 31st, we are taking a break from that. So if you have fallen behind in your reading of the story, which I'm sure none of you in this room have at all, uh, you know, you can kind of get caught up and it's a, it'll take, we'll, so we'll take a break on the 24th and the 31st and then resume back again on January 7th. So um, a good time to kind of catch up on that if you have been falling behind. Uh, during this Advent season, we are taking a look at the theme of kings and kingdoms. And, and it, it's a rather um, disappointing look, if you will, as we look at some of these kings and their stories. And, and the good news is, is that eventually we get to the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords in Jesus Christ. And the one who brings his kingdom, uh, which is different than any earthly kingdom. He brings literally uh, the kingdom of God, which is part of what we're going to talk about on the morning of Christmas uh, Eve. But, but we're looking at these different kings and kind of the ways in which they ruled and the things that we can learn from them. And, and perhaps even, you know, what is it that, that, that we can gain from their lives to help teach us as we think about how to live faithfully and fully for God? Uh, we talked about that li- last week with, with David and just his expression of gratitude towards God and his expression um, of his humility and his desire to be generous with that which God has given, had given to him. This morning, uh, we're going to take up the story of Solomon. And it's an interesting story, and if you've been reading through that, you know that, and as we'll see in, in just a few moments, that Solomon was known uh, for his great wisdom. So um, I was uh, looking at something the other day, and and I and I had not realized this, but in November of this past of uh, last November, like three weeks ago, November, um, the tenth anniversary of the Kindle happened. Y'all, who, anyone read books on Kindles or ebook readers or something? And it's, it's amazing to think that the Kindle has been around for ten years. And, and, and I remember a couple of years ago, um, you know, and if you have a Kindle, if you have any sort of e-reader, the thing I like about it is you can kind of highlight it as you're reading. And then uh, for me, it's great because then I can cut and paste it into a sermon, which is really nice. And I don't have to write it all out. I can just cut it and paste it. But, you know, Kindle tracks all of that. And they, a couple of years ago, released um, the most highlighted passage of anything that is found on Kindle. 
So we're going to do a little guess this morning and see if you all can guess which book it came from. All right, so the most high, this is 20, I think it's 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. So the most highlighted line, and I'm going to give you the quote in just a minute because it actually ties into my sermon, okay? So maybe, maybe that will give you a clue in, in some of this, all right? I'm sure that helps a lot. Uh, most highlighted book, okay? What do you think? All right, man, you all had a lot of answers there. What, what, say it again. The Bible, it's not the Bible. Not Shakespeare. Think more modern. Not Star Wars. <laughs> more modern than Star Wars. Not Harry Potter. After Harry Potter, but somewhat like Harry Potter in the same kind of genre. Hunger Games. How many of you all have read any of the Hunger Games trilogy? Okay, so the most quoted line is from Suzanne Collins' trilogy called The Hunger Games, From Catching Fire. Okay? So none of you probably would have ever even thought of that. That would be the most highlighted thing in any of the books that Amazon tracks. But here's the quote. It's a great quote for thinking about the life of Solomon. It's Katniss, who's one of the lead characters in here. And and you can go and I'm not going to explain all the story to you. But she says this in, in, in the book. Because sometimes things happen to people... And they're not equipped to deal with them. Sometimes things happen to people and they're not equipped to deal with them. And I think as we even think about our own lives, there is great wisdom in this line. Because we've all experienced those moments when something happens to us. And we really don't feel equipped to know how to deal with it. And if you think about the story of Solomon, this, this is a part in the essence of his story. I mean, can you imagine having to fulfill, having to walk into the footsteps of King David? I mean, what's it like to be the son of King David? The man, as the scriptures describe it, is a man after God's own heart. And Solomon knows that he is being called to something that he does not feel equipped to do. And so we pick up our text this morning then in 1 Kings chapter 3, and we see what Solomon does. We see this encounter between God and Solomon. And we'll uh, read the first 15 verses, and if you would pray with me first, that would be great. Uh, God, thanks for this morning. Thanks for this moment. Thanks, God, that in Jesus Christ we encounter the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And though earthly kings have their faults, we know that our heavenly king has no faults, that our future is safe in his hands. But God, as we can consider this topic of wisdom and what it is that we can learn um, from Solomon, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear what it is that we need to hear this day. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, 1 Kings 3, verse 1. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace in the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David, except, and this has got to be careful here, that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place at that time. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. How would we respond to that? Solomon, what do you desire? What is your heart's desire? Ask it and let me give it to you. Verse six, Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. So what Solomon does, he describes the covenant says, God, this is what you have done for my father. Um, This is what I long to be a part of. Verse 7, 
Now, Lord, my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Uh, Solomon's basically saying, I don't know how to come or go when it comes to leading these people. Completely humble statement. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth or for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Notice God says, if you will do this, this will happen. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. What would you have me do for you, God asks. And of all the things that Solomon could have asked for, particularly as a king, he asks for one thing. Verse 9, so give your servant a discerning heart. Give to me, Lord, a heart that listens and is obedient. It's interesting there that word for um, discerning is a, a root that comes or comes out of the root uh, Hebrew word shema. So if you remember, we sometimes talk about the shema, which is out of Deuteronomy uh, chapter six, and it begins, "Hero Israel." The Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. The the people of Israel call that the Shema, but they call it that because it begins with that word here. The word here, the word Shema, is an interesting word because it has three different meanings all tied up in one word. It means hear, it means listen, and it means obey. Because when we think of something, when we hear something or we listen to something, very rarely do we necessarily tie in the connotation that it also has to do with obedience. But what Solomon is saying to God when he asks for this discerning heart is he's saying, God, allow me to listen to you so that I might be able to listen to those around me and allow me to be obedient to your word and your commands which is really quite a wise thing to ask for. This discerning heart, this idea of God, not only do I want to listen to you, but I want to be obedient to you. And I think one of the things we struggle with, or at least I certainly struggle with, is I try to listen to God and listen for God's wisdom, is I am not a great listener. My brain moves too fast sometimes, and I forget what I've even been asking God for. Like, you know, two or th- do any of you ever have that issue? Like, you pray for something two or three minutes ago, and you're already off on some other tangent. Maybe I'm the only one that has that problem around here. Um, but but it's, it's that sense of saying, do we listen well? There's this great story told of... Um, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, the author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and C.S. Lewis, who wrote numerous books, but The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, we all know very well, and, and, uh, and Mere Christianity. But um, when Tolkien was writing The Hobbit and, and trying to get the manuscript all done, he, he sent it out. He got it finished of what he thought it was fine and then sent it to other people uh, to them to proofread, which is always a dangerous thing to do, right? I mean, you, you take this great work of art or great thing that you've written and then you have to like send it out to others to let them read it. And there's this great thing that happened when he sent it to C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis started reading through it, and and, and I'm not sure if Tolkien really wanted C.S. Lewis's feedback or not, but, you know, the academics, they love to give feedback to one another. So C.S. Lewis writes back to Tolkien, and he says, I love the story, but in the beginning, there is way too much hobbit talk. 
is the to- the hobbits talk incessantly. You've got to cut out the talking. That was a pretty smart move. So what did Tolkien do? He cut out the hobbit talk. But I like that sense of saying sometimes there's too much human talk. Sometimes in my own relationship with God, there's too much of me talking at God, downloading on God the things that I want him to help with or guide me into, and there's not much listening. And so I think Solomon is brilliant when he says, God, help me to be obedient, but help me to also listen well. If we want to live wisely, we have to not only be obedient, but we also have, also have to learn how to listen. But here's the deal. And, and, and as you've been reading through this story, and if you know the story of Scripture, there is this constant tension of saying, how can someone like Solomon be so wise and mess it up so bad? Does anybody notice that? I mean, it's not just the story of Solomon. It's all these people who are trying to be faithful to God and live this life that's known for, for, for being you know, filled with God's hope and, and God's life. And, and they still can't quite seem to get it right. Martin Luther talked about this and he said, here is the reality of our lives. We are both righteous and sinners at the same time. And I'm like, I don't like that. I mean, I know you are the, you know, the grandfather of the Reformation and you did all this great sort of stuff and we just celebrated 500 years of that. But Luther is so right on of saying, this is our struggle. We are declared righteous because what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, it is given to us, that when God looks at us, thank goodness, he sees one who has, who has been covered in the blood of Christ. There is this sense that we are a new creation. But every one of us in this room struggles with sin. We struggle with brokenness. And Solomon was no different. I mean, he wrote these incredible words. I love how the story puts it all together because it kind of talks about Solomon's life. And then it grabs some of the the great Proverbs that we know and kind of, you know, it's just like Solomon's writing those. And, And you see that in his younger days as he's writing these great pearls of wisdom. But he didn't know how to live them. You see this even in the beginning of the text that we read this morning. If you were listening listening, uh, carefully, it starts off by saying, well, in in verse 1, Solomon made arrangement to marry marry Pharaoh's daughter. Eh, Right? Bad move, Solomon. You keep reading through through verse 3, and I highlight, I emphasize that a little bit more as we are reading through this. That Solomon loved God except what? He went to the high places and offered sacrifices. He could not get it right. This man who was so wise and so blessed and yet struggled so much with loving God wholeheartedly. And this is the very tension in which we find ourselves. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 7. And I'm kind of jumping into it uh, kind of right in the middle of the context, but I think, I, I think it'll be okay for the point I'm, I'm trying to make. But, but I think about this, and I mean, if the Apostle Paul, this one who loved God wholeheartedly, this one who, you know, just basically took on the evangelistic thrust of the entire world. I I mean, I love, I don't remember who said this, but someone had this great point when they were talking about the Apostle Paul and all the rest of the apostles. And because basically the story that happens in scripture is the Apostle Paul says to Peter and all the other guys, hey, you will handle Jerusalem and I'll take care of the rest of the world. Okay, because that's kind of like, I mean, Paul's got missionary journey after missionary journey after missionary journey, and he's just constantly on the move and he's constantly proclaiming the gospel and he's constantly rethinking, how do I engage and what does it look like in this culture? And what does it look like in this context and had wisdom beyond compare? And then he writes this Romans chapter seven, verse 19. 
talking about living the life of faith. For I do not do, this is kind of a tongue twister, so hopefully I won't mess it up. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So Paul's getting, he's struggling with this thing that the Luther would write about later, being a sinner and righteous at the same time. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And then this line, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then this, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul's struggling with this issue. He's like, Lord, I want to be righteous. I want to make the right decision. I want to say the right thing. I want to live the right way. I want to be engaged in this world. I want wisdom. And yet the very good that I'm trying to do, I keep messing it up. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we're like, that's my story as well. I try and I struggle and I push to live the right way, Paul says. And I still mess it up. Oh, wretched man that I am. But he doesn't end there. Because then he says, but thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for the one of whom, of whose birth we will celebrate in just a few weeks. Thanks be to God that in spite of my sinfulness, I am made righteous by Jesus Christ. And this, my friends, is where our hope lies. That we do now have the presence of Christ amongst us. We do have, as we'll talk about in just a moment, the power of the Holy Spirit with us. Because Christ's desire of our lives is that we live wisely. That we go into the world. That we make a difference in the world. That we engage the culture and the society with our minds, with our hearts, with the discerning heart that Solomon prayed for. In Matthew chapter 10, um, Jesus begins to send out the disciples. And he sends them out two by two. And you may uh, recall the story. And, and, and I always find <laughs> the, the way that Jesus did ministry was amazing. Because he gathers the apostles, they get to hang on him for a little bit, and then he says, now go, get out of here. No more Bible study. No more sitting around at church. No more sitting around the synagogue. None of that sort of stuff. Get out of here and go and live. And you got to think if you're the apostles, they're like, I mean, in Matthew chapter 10, chapter 10, it's crazy because as he starts this section that we're, you know, I'm going to talk about in just a second, it says he gives them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. And if you're one of the disciples, you've got to be like, man, I was fishing like six months ago. How in the world am I going to do these things? But Jesus and his mission work is always sending us. And here's what he says. This is verse, um, verse 16, where it talks about wisdom. And Jesus says this, to, this is to the disciples. This, this is... Um, This is probably not the words you want to give to people as you send them out to go and do missionary work, but it's the words that Jesus gives them. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Thanks, Lord. That sounds awesome. That's just what I want to be about. Therefore, be as shrewd or wise as snakes and as innocent as doves. I love how Dale Bruner talks about this. He says, you have to imagine the disciples going out with a coat of arms, right? 
and that coat of arms has wolves, sheep, or a wolf, a sheep, a snake, and a dove, right? And, and, and Bruner says, he says, this then, th- this is, is, is the, the armor that we bear into the world. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, you, you read that passage and you want to say to Jesus, couldn't you give a better image than sheep? Lions. I'd like to be a lion like that. Bear, you know, something that's like big, mean, nasty. Like, Lord, if you're sending me out into this world, I want to be equipped to handle the things of the world. If I'm going to take on wolves, I want to be bigger, badder, smarter than any wolf that's going to come my way. Would anybody else like that? Or is that just kind of me? Instead, Jesus says, no, you're going to be like a little sheep. I'm like, well, sheep need a shepherd. And Jesus would be like, yeah, sheep need a shepherd. Very wise, Paul, smart thinking. Glad, glad you kind of figured that out in all the midst of this story. But Jesus says, look, I am sending you. And this is kind of his missional thrust. This is him saying, you've got to engage the world with the good news that I am giving to you. And here's the image that you're going to carry with you. You will be like sheep among wolves. The world will not always look kindly upon you or what it is that you are doing. He said, so you need to be wise. You need to be shrewd. Wise as snakes, innocent as doves. He said, I'm not sending you out there foolishly. I'm sending you out there to do a great work. And oftentimes... For many of us, when we think about how it is that we do the mission that God has called us to, um, I, I, I kind of I use the word it's subversive. Most of us are not going to become evangelists who are up in front of thousands or hundreds of people or whatever preaching the gospel. That, that, that's not, I mean, maybe someone sitting in this room, that's going to happen to them. But for most of us, that is not going to happen. That's not going to be the essence of who we are. So Jesus says you need to be wise and you need to be innocent. You almost need to be subversive. I, I love that and you all, if you've been here the last couple of years, I've used this image because I just think it's a great image that it, Jesus talks about a couple chapters later in Matthew chapter 13. But he talks about the woman who has the little bit of yeast and he says she mixes it into 60 pounds of dough and everything is changed. Because that little bit of yeast that hardly anybody sees. And Jesus says, and this is what the kingdom of God is like. Just a little bit of yeast mixed into the dough and it changes everything. And so as we think about our witness within this world where we live, the world we inhabit, the people we have conversations with. We need to be praying, Lord, make me wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Give me that kind of integrity. But we also, as followers of Christ and as those who love God, we're called to to engage in conversations as well. We're we're called to look at the world that we are a part of and figure out how do we speak to that? How do we make sense of that? God, give us some wisdom on that as well. And here's what I love is the the second text that I have uh, there for you in our our, um, scripture this morning actually comes from the next chapter in 1 Kings, and it's chapter 4. And if you've got kids or grandkids in our, in our children's ministry, it's verse 29 that they're uh, actually learning and, and working on today in Sunday school. But I find it fascinating that in the midst of this talking about all the wisdom that, that Solomon had, as it said, he also engaged in the things of this world. God gave Solomon, verse 29, wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. That's a lot of wisdom. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, uh, the Ezraite, wiser than Haman, Chalcol, Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about, now this is what I find fascinating. He spoke of things of science. 
botanist, biology, probably a lot of other things here that I'm not, don't know all the words for, for the science to talk about that. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of this wisdom. He was sitting there talking biology with people. He was talking botany with people. This is how wise he was because he was looking at things of the world and saying, do you see how God is at work in these things? For the past year and a half or so, we have been doing these STEAM events, um, bringing in different scientists to talk to us about how do faith and science uh, work together. Jennifer has been doing a great job of of spearheading that for us. And in January, um, we have Deborah Harzma, who is the uh, uh, president of BioLogos that's going to be with us. She's an astrophysicist. And she's going to talk about how we see God's handiwork with us in the midst of looking at the stars and looking at the heavens. And it's, it's these, these events we've had have been amazing because these people have this great faith. Look at the world that God has created and say, this is where God is at work. This is how I see God at work in whether it's mathematical figures, whether it's in the heavens, whether it's in creation, whatever it is. This is how I see God at work. And I love that Solomon is looking at the plants and he's looking at the hyssop and he's looking at reptiles and birds and fish and saying, do you see how God is work? This is how wise he was because he looks at God's creation. And says, do you see God? Do you see the handiwork of God? And we, my friends, God gives each one of us wisdom. It varies. We have wisdom in different sorts of areas. But the promise is this, is that God will give us wisdom. Because here's the good news of Matthew chapter 10 after Jesus says, hey, I'm sending you out as you know, sheep among wolves. But there is this good news because sometimes when it comes to our faith and it's how those disciples had to feel, they're like, Lord, we don't know what we are going to say. But Jesus says, I'll answer that for you. This is verse 19 of Matthew chapter 10. Make sure I get that right, yeah. But when they arrest you, okay, so here's the good news, right? Because when you go out as sheep among wolves, guess what's going to happen to you? You're not going to be treated well. The world is not going to treat you well. We live in this this crazy dream, this crazy reality that if we live a good life, all is going to go well for us. There'll never be any trouble. There'll never be any sorrow. Do you know who is the picture perfect person that to say that is not true? Jesus. Because Jesus lived a more perfect life than any of us, right? He was without sin. And his life ended rather miserably. He went through a lot for us. Okay, sorry, that was a little tangent there, a little rant. Just wanted to, you know, I just want to make sure that we get this. Living a good life doesn't give us any promises that everything is always going to be great, at least from an earthly perspective. But when they arrest you, do not worry about, and I love this line, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. This is the game changer between Old Testament and New Testament. This is why you want to live after Jesus. Okay? Old Testament, guess who is not present in people's lives? The Holy Spirit had not yet come in all of his fullness. That doesn't happen until Christ returns to heaven. And we are told the Gospel of John makes that very clear. That God will send the Comforter. That he will send the Holy Spirit. So you and I have this possibility of living wisely. Because the Spirit of God dwells within us. Jesus says to his apostles, you're going to go. And you're going to be arrested. And you're not going to know what to say. And the Spirit of God will speak for you. That's his promise. And that promise is true for us as well. And all we have to do is ask. I was talking to my wife yesterday about what I was preaching and um, telling her I was was preaching on wisdom. And she says, you've got to use James chapter 1 verse 5. And I said, I've already done it. It's already in my sermon. I've already, I was like, that's good confirmation right there that, you know, we're both in agreement on that thought. But this is, this is such a great promise. If you're looking for wisdom, if you're trying to figure something out, if you want a discerning heart, James says, here's what you do. Verse 5, 
chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, which is all of us, you should ask God, who, and I love how he describes this, who gives generously to all without finding fault. There is no guilt. There is no shame. James says, just ask for wisdom. And it will be given to you. And then verse 6, here's the warning. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the sea. We'd like to just stop at verse 5. Lord, give us wisdom. James says, God will give you wisdom. But you have to have faith. So it's Lord, give us faith and give us wisdom. The final thing of wisdom is this that I want to suggest this morning. And this concerns our own lives. We need to be saying to God, not only just to give us wisdom to engage the world, to engage society, but Lord, give us wisdom to finish well. We are seeing a lot of people not finishing well. A lot of terrible things that have happened that have been hidden and covered up for years. They are not finishing well. Solomon, same thing. First Kings chapter 11 only took eight chapters. There were some warnings that happened in chapter 3. Then we get to verse 4. Chapter 11. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. And then skipping over to verses 9 through 11. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. For all the wisdom that Solomon had, he did not finish well. Years ago, um, when I was kind of trying to create some principles um, to, to live my life by, the, the kind of the last one I had uh, was that I always wanted to be a lifelong learner. Um, I, I still want to be a lifelong learner. I have not, have not canceled that one out. But I've changed it more to this, that I want to finish well. For all I know... I may finish tomorrow. There's no promises. But I now pray to God that he will give me the wisdom to know how to finish well whenever that day comes. To not cover up, to not hide, to not betray. Lord, what does it look like to finish well? Because Solomon is example, an example of how not to finish well. And the crazy thing is it doesn't just cost him. It costs the generations that are to come. Because next week we read about that kingdom literally being torn in two. And so, my friends, for us, let us seek to live wisely. Let us recognize the struggle that there is of being both righteous and sinners at the same time. But let us also remember that Christ gives us wisdom, shrewdness to live into this world, to speak into this world, to reveal the love of a Savior. Let us ask for that kind of wisdom and let us all finish well. Pray with me, please. God, for this morning, thank you. Thank you that in Christ we meet the fullness of wisdom. 
in all that wonder and all that beauty, we encounter the one who helps us to finish well. So God, help us to right what is wrong. Help us to focus our eyes on you again and again. And give us wisdom into knowing how to live faithfully and fully for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. Here's some of what's going on around La Jolla Press. You can also find a complete listing on our website at ljpress.org. The annual choir Christmas concert will be today, Sunday, December 10th at 4 and 7 p.m. Join the LJPC family for a joyful celebration of Christmas. LJPC's choral ensembles and a professional orchestra create a moving retelling of the Christmas story through song and scripture. The concert will feature many carols, including longtime LJPC favorite, The Many Moods of Christmas, as well as Vivaldi's setting of Mary's Song. It's a free concert with no tickets required. Interfaith Shelter is coming up, and we are hosting individuals and families on a path to escape homelessness, December 31st through January 13th. We need help with setup, teardown, dinner providers, overnight hosts, and children's homework helpers. You can sign up or get more information by contacting John Mangrich. John's phone number is 858-483-9654, or you can email him at jom360 at gmail.com. Family Movie Night is this week, Wednesday, December 13th, from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Pizza dinner starts at 4.30, and the movie, Polar Express, follows at 5.30 p.m. Be sure to pre-purchase your tickets online at ljpress.org slash movie. The cost is $5 per person or $20 per family. Please bring a new pair of pajamas to donate to a foster child. For more information, contact Kay Foltz at... K-A-Y-F-O-L-T-Z at gmail.com. As you may recall, LJPC did a major renovation of our sanctuary and children's wing in 2015 and 16. Pledges were to be completed by the end of 2017. If you are not sure you have completed your pledge, please contact the business office. If you would like more information about these announcements or anything else happening at La Jolla Prez, you can find our website at ljpress.org. That's l-j-p-r-e-s dot o-r-g. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. Thanks for listening and have a blessed day.